many collapses, I'm just going to talk about a small one uh, with long-term uh, consequences. So here you see the march of democracy over the last 200 years. As you all know, democracies were incredibly rare 200 years ago. Today they're pretty common, and it's a nice, optimistic, feel-good, upward-pointing line, except for this period here. Okay? This is where a lot of democracies uh, die, and then it sort of comes back. And I want to talk about this dip here, and I'm going to talk about just one country. I'm going to talk about Germany, which, you know, it's only a single case, but it's one with major repercussions in the form of uh, genocide, world war, and so on. So there's many ways to approach this issue. Um, Tom and I have worked on this. Uh, I've worked with other co-authors on related work. Now, if Tom had been here, he would have told you something about the first paper here on the list, which basically has the punchline that we were never quite sure how important the influence of money was on the rise of the Nazis, because it was a very hard thing to trace, and German big business basically tried what it could to make sure that uh, it wasn't easy to trace. So what we did was to see what the stock market saw. So there were rumors that certain companies were in bed with the uh, Nazis in the 1930s, and nobody was ever sure if this was actually true, and we had the not terribly surprising idea of saying, well, what happens to the stock market prices of those firms that everybody said had a connection? And bingo, they actually went through the roof, okay? But I actually don't want to talk about these two first papers here, and I want to talk about these other two. Um, one's called Bowling for Fascism, it's with Shankar Satyanath and Nico Voigtländer, um, and another one uh, is ongoing research um, uh, called the Triumph of the Hive. So. What's the question that we're trying to answer? The question that we're trying to answer is sort of summarized in this picture, which is not a family picture, but it could be, okay? So uh, one of my grandfathers was actually a member of the Nazi party, was actually a member of the SR, um, and as many people will tell you in a similar position, he was actually a very nice man, okay? So you have to sort of take these things uh, head on and ask yourself, how is it possible that there's not just this hardcore group of committed extremists foaming at the mouth, but there are these millions and millions of people whose cooperation and willing acquiescence makes possible that first of all democracy fails and afterwards horrible things happen. And that's where I want to go today. So if you generically think about where why is it that sometimes democracies run out of Democrats, which is what some people have said happened to Weimar? Um, you can think of this in a whole variety of ways. Um, there's one view that says, you know, the Germans were always waiting to commit the Holocaust that's associated with the name of Danny Goldhagen. So basically, since 1500, they were waiting for their chance, and after 1933, it finally came, so they're all evil, and that's an interpretation that I'm not going to spend much time on. Um, there's an alternative approach that says, you know, industrialization creates all these rootless individuals. They stream into the large industrial centers, and there, because they don't have any connections and anybody to give them a sense of sort of identity or um, uh, purpose, they become victims to either communist or fascist ideology. And there's a third generic approach that says, look, um, everyone has this dark side. So whether you think about the Stanford prison experiment where it seems very easy to turn people into pretty sadistic jailers or the famous Milgram experiment uh, where if you're told that it's part of a scientific experiment, people will administer electroshocks until people pass out, you have the sense that everyone is basically in epsilon away from being a killer depending on social context, which of course is also a little bit difficult as an analytical approach to take seriously because then the question becomes why doesn't this happen all the time? Why doesn't this happen uh, every three, five, seven years? Okay, so I want to approach this as an economist. And as you know, economics in its purest form always said people maximize utility, they're selfish, they're omniscient, um, and basically they just follow their narrow economic instincts. And there's some element in this that we can ex use to explain some of the rise of extremist movements, in this case, the Nazi party. Um, as you know, there's been a revolution in economics with behavioral economics, with a lot of things from the lab that say people don't behave like that, they're just not like that. And you know, my uh, uh, colleague and friend Ernst Fair has been important in partly reshaping our views here, saying, look, you know, people actually do all this stuff that actually doesn't seem to 
uh, be very selfish at all, but they seem to do it all the time. They reciprocate when they shouldn't. Um, they care about fairness. They punish others without any interest in their own bottom line because it helps to cooperate in the long run. And you sort of get this Mother Teresa view of wonderful individuals violating economic rationality to do good things. And then as we sort of scratch a little bit below the surface of that, we find that there's a surprising malleability of moral behavior. And the same people that seem so keen to care about fairness, if you give them a chance to cheat unobserved, suddenly do. And if you tell them that, you know, they can go to the corner and throw the dice six times and help themselves to 100 euros every time six comes up, many of them suddenly throw six dies on six in a row. Um, so cheating is endemic if you think that somebody else is doing it. People avoid visits if somebody's going to ask them for a charity donation, but if they don't get advised beforehand, they'll happily say, hey, yeah, of course, you know, I believe in the cause and give you money. So there's this additional dimension where the way we're seen by others seems to matter a huge deal for how we actually act, how moral we act. And that doesn't have to go to the good equilibrium. That can go to the bad equilibrium. And I'm going to try to show you research that thinks about and tries to make analytically tractable this particular angle of where evil comes from. Okay? So let me talk about the one paper. So I don't know if you've seen the film. It's actually a great film called The Joneses. Um, so they look like a normal upper middle class American family, except that they're not related and they're actually stealth marketers. Okay? So they move into a new house, they drive uh, fashionable cars. They wear great clothes, and they just project this image that everybody then wants to copy, okay? And of course, it gets more complicated and everything falls apart. Now, that looks like an innocent story, but what I'm going to try to tell you is that there's a strong connection with this. This is a scene from Schindler's List, and the same kind of social dynamic actually causes the rise, uh, uh, leads people to participate in extremist groups. So, in what I think of still is one of the most insightful pieces of social science research, um, a sociologist by the name of Theodor Abel, who emigrated wisely from Europe in the early 1930s, conducted an essay competition when he was still already in New York, and he put an ad in a Nazi newspaper saying, you can win 500 Reichsmarks if you send in the winning entry in the essay competition, How I Became a Nazi. Okay? So we have these 800 documents where people talk, thinking they have a sympathetic audience, talk about how they became Nazis. And here's one example. One guy says, I became acquainted with a colleague of mine, of, uh, of my own age, with whom I had frequent conversations. He was a calm, quiet person whom I esteemed very highly. When I found out that he was one of the local leaders of the National Socialist Party, my opinion of it, as a group of criminals, changed completely. So here's someone who thinks they're all crooks. And then through personal contact, he says, hey, they're actually nice guys. And he joins too. And <clears throat> the question is, how much can you generalize this? So for the town, university town of Marburg, we actually have the registers of the charities that people, and the clubs and associations that people join. And we know who joined the Nazi party. And you have guys like Emil Wissner, who is a middle-aged salesman. He's an avid athlete. He joins the National Shopkeepers Association. He's like the archetype from a Putnam uh, textbook of how to be a good citizen. He has broad interests, is civic engaged, civically engaged, except that um, he also becomes a member of the Nazi party and convinces many of his athlete and shopkeeping friends that they should do the same. So together with Shankar and Nico, what we try to see is how much we can generalize this kind of thing. And note that this is a sort of anti-Hannah Arendt story. So these are not ruthless individuals. These are the well-connected guys with you know, lots of social capital um, that start to do things that we think are problematic. So this is what we do. We collect data on the density of associations in different towns and cities. And what we find is that the closer those networks are, the higher the entry rates for the Nazi party. And you can look at just chess clubs, hiking clubs, um, <clears throat> Uh, budgie breeders, you get the same thing. Of course, it's even easier if it's an association of veterans uh, who gather every Thursday, have a beer, and shout down with France. Okay? Okay, so <clears throat> the second piece that I want to talk about has to do with something perhaps even more unreflected, which is the effect of marches on voting behavior. So marching and 
big assemblies seem to be something that parties invest a lot of effort in. They're convinced that it somehow changes behavior. The evidence for this is kind of limited, but my co-author David Yanagazawa dropped actually has a beautiful paper on the Tea Party where it shows exactly this. And we're trying to do the same thing here, looking at Hamburg in 1932. Okay, so we know where the Nazis march in the streets. That's the black lines here. And the redder the uh, dots here on the slide, the bigger the swing towards the Nazis, okay? The more people are willing to vote for them. So you can already see that people exposed to the march, people looking out of the window and seeing how these large groups of disciplined people march by are much more likely to actually cast their vote in favor of this extremist movement as well, okay? So here you see just a scatter plot. This is the change in Nazi support over a very short period during which they had just re-allowed marches of this kind, okay? So this seems to suggest that there's something about spectacle and an almost emotional appeal that changes people's minds. This is not optimizing behavior where new information arrives and then people decide, now I'm going to think about this differently. And what we're trying to do next, and for which we have some evidence already, is that this depends crucially on the type of social interaction. If you talk to a lot of other people who've also seen the march because they happen to be in a church district through which the route also went, then this effect becomes bigger. If a lot of the people from the same profession saw the march, and you work in just one or two places of work, like the docks or the shipping, uh, ship builder, shipbuilding yards, then the effect is also bigger. So what this seems to suggest is that it's a social echo chamber effect that seems to have a pretty big effect on what people actually do. In this case, it's not as costly as entering the Nazi party, it's just ticking a box. But look at the size of those effects. You know, you go from 7 to 10% just because the Nazis marched in front of your house. Okay, so uh, my time's almost up here. So undoubtedly, if we want to think about one case of democratic collapse, Big business uh, donations matter, economics matters, the underlying vulnerability matters. And we have some other work that shows that uh, the turnaround after 33 helps a lot to increase enthusiasm for the Nazi party. Uh, the road building seems to do something in terms of economic stimulus and then maps directly into vote gains in one of the last plebiscites of the Nazi era. But there's an additional factor that we think is a little bit neglected where things like social interactions, social capital, social multiplier effects come in, and I think they can help us close this gap of not being able to fully account for why democracies at some point run out of Democrats, and on top of that, why those people who have given up on democracy afterwards become quite fervent and enthusiastic supporters of dictatorships. Thank you. You guys, I could talk now if you want, or you guys could. Okay, we have a slight problem because I couldn't, I'm the chair, but I'm also supposed to speak. And I had to chair the last session, which meant I couldn't quite get here, I can't fly. Um, but I think it makes sense in terms of the exposition if I simply talk for a few minutes um, on the, I was going to set up a discussion of the Italian case and the German case based on the paper, and that will provide, I think, a very natural lead-in for everybody's talks if we do it now. Coming later makes no sense at all. Um, let me explain. I think the big problem here that is this in this panel is really how does populism end? And there was a clear old narrative to that in the case of Germany. And that was, um, in, in the literature, it was represented by Carl Dietrich Brocker. And like in the Nuremberg uh, trial volumes, which produced enormous amounts of evidence. And say so between 1948 uh, and down to the mid 70s, that was pretty straightforward. Everybody knew somehow that Big business had a major role in Hitler coming to power. And then Henry Turner wrote a famous book on big business and, and, and Hitler. And he claimed that essentially they had very little role. And he gave you an impression just as we turn to the 
just in general neoliberalism in the rest of society, that there were all the, the most businessmen were interested in profits, not in politics. They didn't know much, et cetera. And basically, there led to be some fairly ugly quarrels in which some younger historians had to leave the profession. But that narrative dominated uh, down to the point, and it still, I think, has a big role in uh, standard historiography, though people have become a touch bolder, but not much. That's when Joachim and I met each other. And we said, do you believe this? No, I don't believe this. And I'd been working a bit in German archives, as he does. And so we decided, uh, well, there's got to be a different approach to this. And by then, the familiar analysis of event analysis was becoming, was becoming standard. And when like, we saw the people doing the papers on Malaysia and Indonesia, I thought, hey, we could do this on a really big case. Let's do it on Hitler. Now, there were no data. You type in the Berliner Börsenzeitung, uh, and then I recall going twice through the all five volumes of the Handbuch der Deutschen Aktiengesellschaft to check uh, the people were really on the company boards. They say that's when we found a bunch of errors. The people had been reproaching others for errors, perhaps just had ignored. Um, and so we wrote that paper, which is in the QJE. I want. I have. I don't mind saying I want to bet. <laughs> <laughs> with Joachim on that. Uh, he was prepared, he bet that they would actually throw it off, throw it out without a review, and I took that bet, and then I won the bet that they would take it. Um, you can think about that in relation to Jakob Capeller's model there, where it turned out that even a slight error throws the entire uh, academic evaluation process uh, into a black hole. Well, um, uh, all right. So, um, you know, since then, uh, the history remains out of tune, but sort of economics has got uh, the reality of it. Now, then Peter Langer came along with his magnificent book on Paul Reusch, one of the very most important German industrialists. You should, uh, everybody should read that book if you can do German. Alas, it's not translated. Um, and... Uh, by, you should compare it to many of the subsidized histories of individual firms that have been coming out in the last 30 years. And you, you can see, because I, I worked a lot in the Reusch papers uh, too, and there you get a totally different world than the stuff that you have been reading for the last 30 years in German history. And in that sense, I think, we're well on our way toward establishing a true, sensible account uh, of how did Hitler come to power, and if in this very loose sense of how does populism end, we are, in effect, back to the future, uh, maybe just in time to learn some important lessons. I'll come to that in a second. But there remains the question of Italy where uh, it was a kind of funny historiography. Now, there I don't really read Italian, but I read avidly, and I had the good fortune to run into the three folks who wrote this paper, and when they said they would be willing to tackle the question of Mussolini in an event analysis format, Einat was happy to make the grant. Um, and uh, so you'll, read, you'll hear from them in one second. But uh, my sort of big point is this. You, if you think about this for a second, you can see, yeah, okay, there ha it helps if there are a lot of people in distress. That's obvious. It helps further if you get demagogic politicians who will step out, and that pot, the sort of populist political virus spreads. The, the interesting question that one might want to ask now is, okay, what happens if uh, elites all want something else, say, free trade, uh, and the universal principle of comparative advantage, even if it's not to everybody's comparative advantage. Um, and the masses want something else. When I hear certain European politicians saying quite openly they've had too much democracy, it would be better if we had fewer elections, I begin to wonder. Uh, but that's for another panel, not this one. Um, that's my 
pitch on this, and I think I would now just like to hear from my Italian colleagues. we have seen the publication of many works concerning with the search for empirical evidence of a positive relation between political connections, economic rent, and the value of firms. Our research provides for the first time an analysis of the value of political connections between Italian firms and the fascist regime during the years of Mussolini's rise to power, that is in the years from 1921 to 1925. Mussolini's rise to power took place in a context of social uh, instability and economic crisis. Broadly, at the end of World War I, Italy had heavy international debts, there was a high rate of unemployment, and the social um, situation was characterized by repeated strikes in cities and country. In this context, Mussolini was able to uh, present the fascist movement as a safeguard of public order by means of the fascist action squads. In spring 1921, Mussolini transformed the fascist movement into the National Fascist Party, PNF. And in the election that took place in May 1921, 53 candidates of the PNF to get, um, became deputies. In this group, there was Mussolini as well. However, the general elections of May 1921 opened a period of political instability. Three different governments followed each other, the Bonomi government, the first FACTA government, and the second FACTA government. And um, from, today, uh, view, from today's point of view, it is um, the striking fact um, is that um, the leaders of the other Italian political parties weren't able to overcome their personal interest and to establish um, a joint front against the fascism. As we know, the first Mussolini uh, government began, uh, uh, followed the second FACTA government and began with an unexpected event, that is La Marcia su Roma, the, mar the March on Rome, that is the fascist military expedition to Rome. Here are the significant dates of this event. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that the Italian army was able to defend Rome but the king, Victor Emanuel III of Savoia, refused to uh, declare the state of siege and compelled the fact, compelled the fact to resign, and uh, he gave Mussolini the task of forming a new government. Today it is understand why the king refused to sign this state of siege. And uh, the extent of uh, uh, Italian magnates' support for, to Mussolini's controversial point. But, uh, one, but um, one point is clear. After the march on Rome, Confindustria, the Confederation of Italian Industry, claimed, that, claimed to have exerted an, a direct and pressing influence in favor of Mussolini's solution. So our paper addresses the following question. How much was it worth to have close, early connection with the PNF. Our main point of reference is the work made by, made by Ferguson and Voth. For, following on their tracks, we perform an event analysis in order to analyze the reaction of the Italian, Milan, of the Italian Stock Exchange to the march on Rome. In our work, we define a firm as connected when historical research has um, as, sh as, shown, as shown the existence of these connections. Moreover, we have surveyed the pages of Mussolini's Popolo d'Italia, his newspaper, in search for the companies that purchased advertising spaces during the first, first year of its publication. In this respect, our work enriched the current knowledge uh, concerning the origin of the flow of capital that financed Mussolini in the first year of his, of his um, political project. Our, we perform an event analysis. Our event window covers the march on Rome and a 21 day event window is employed. <coughs> 10 prevent days, day event day, <coughs> that is the day of the march on Rome, and 10 post event days. Our estimation window covers three months before the event day and our post event window covers three months after the event day. 
However, in contrast to Ferguson vote, we mm, have identified our connected firms performing a social network analysis. This choice due to the mm, peculiarity of the Italian stock market in comparison to the German one. And to our knowledge, this is the first time that uh, a social network analysis is employed together with a, an, an, an event analysis. Today, I will not go into the details of our empirical strategy, and I will show you our, uh, so our final results. Um, our data set, uh, our data came from two different um, sources. Daily stock, stock prices are drawn from uh, a financial newspaper, Il Sole, organo ufficiale della Camera di Commercio e Industria di Milano, and other additional uh, information concerning firm characteristics such as industry classification and composition of boards and, and other things are drawn from an Italian database, Unita <coughs> database. This graph represents the Italian, the Milan Stock Exchange corporate ne network. Our benchmark year is 1921 and the network has been, beat, has, has been built according to interlocking directorates. A connection between two nodes is given by individuals sitting in uh, the boards of both nodes. We applied an algorithm to create uh, a partition of uh, the network into clusters, and uh, only one cluster taken as a whole outperformed the rest of the market during the event day and uh, after the event day. Orange nodes represent the firm or our, connect, connect, or our cluster of connected firms. Node sites reflect degree of connectedness. Here are the details of our cluster of connected firms. There is a um, historiography that uh, supports the composition of this cluster. For instance, we find Banco di Roma, that is a bank, who uh, that, is, that uh, was the major shareholder of uh, um, a group of uh, firms, of sugar firms, such as Distillerie Italiane, Eridania Società Industriale, Zuccherificio Distilleria Alcos Gulinelli, Società Italiana per l'Industria dello Zucchero Indigeno e Società Ligure Lombarda per la Raffinazione degli Zuccheri. This group of, uh, firm, of sugar firms financed Mussolini's uh, newspaper in the first year of its publication. So our analysis um, proposes a new interpretation of the bailout of Banco di Roma that was uh, performed by the first Mussolini uh, government um, in December 1922. We, um, our analysis suggests that bailing uh, Banco di Roma, Mussolini bailed out, bailing out Banco di Roma, Mussolini bailed out a, gro a group of industrialists of the sugar sector uh, who had established early connections uh, with the PNF. So our empirical analysi analysis um, proposes a new interpretation of an, historical, of an historical fact. Here are the results of our, uh, of our um, event analysis. As you can see, uh, during the event day and after the event day, um, the firms of connected firms outperformed the rest of the economy and uh, the abnorm abnormal returns are pervasive from uh, the event day onwards. Here are the details of our analysis. As you can see, after the event day, the coefficient associated uh, to cluster one, that is the cluster of connected firms, is positive under alternative specification and statistically significant as you can see in uh, the table. And to conclude, we have found that, um, some, um, that our uh, firms of connected firms outperformed the rest of the economy during the event, during the event day and after the event day. In, um, mm, the abnormal returns uh, amounted to uh, 2% on a daily uh, basis and 2.8% on a compounded monthly basis. So, thank you.
Okay, the commentators are next. I think well, Peter, Lang. Peter, Peter Langer is, for, is next, right? I, of course, come from a different point of view. You know, at the same time when Mussolini came to power in uh, Italy, 1922, uh, nobody yet knew Adolf Hitler. And Mussolini was his uh, real, he admired him and he wanted to follow in his footsteps. And then he failed miserably on the Bihal Putsch uh, in 1923. And after that, there are a number of years where nobody took the Nazis in Germany seriously. Now, my question is, uh, why was Mussolini and the fascist movement in Italy successful so fast uh, compared to what happened in Germany? In Germany, it came more than 10 years later. Uh, the second question which came to my mind here is that uh, Germany had lost the war, the First World War, and uh, there was a lot of hate against the victors in Germany. But Italy was one of the victors of the First World War. How was it possible that a movement like Mussolini's fascist movements uh, could rise, rise so fast after a victorious war in Italy? These are two questions which, which came to my mind. Okay. Do you have, do, would you like to present more? I mean, it seemed like we got the results, right? On, What's that? On the methodology of, no, we, I think we, I mean, I think we should just stick. I mean, the idea was that of presenting. Oh, go ahead. If, I'm sorry. Looks like I thought that was the presentation, and it, evidently there's some more. So go, just go ahead and do it. Um, yeah. Because, look, let me just say a word about this paper is extremely interesting methodologically. Okay. Because the problem in Italy is, unlike Germany and more advanced countries, the capital markets are not hugely developed, so the possibility of a group affiliation really matters. In a way, it just wasn't a problem in Germany or in the United States if you do these things. Nobody ever checks for, like, whether you belong nowadays, maybe in the past, in the Gilded Age, the J.P. Morgan group or something like that. In Italy, you can't rule that out in the 1920s, and in that respect, um, they faced a problem that basically hasn't been dealt with much. In fact, not at all in the event analysis literature. I'm sorry, I didn't realize, because that, that comes from the fact that I couldn't get here fast enough to. So you want to talk about that? Um, sure. If it would please be possible to go back to some of the slides, I could yeah, just. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Con in any case, then. Can we get the slides or not? Okay. I mean, for our, yes, Great. we can get them. What do you need? Yeah, just. Okay, just a few comments on the methodological issues yes. involved in the paper that, um, as you were mentioning, uh, first gathering all the data set involved merging both stock market data that was published on a daily and then weekly basis uh, by a local newspaper, which involved then going through daily microfilm uh, snapshots of daily data and then transcribing everything. Then that was merged with yearly books that were published and then digitalized in a project called Imita TV, uh, which mainly contained synthetic balance sheets of firms and the compositions of firms uh, of the board of directors of each of these firms. Given that, of course, names were different, then a merging process uh, had to be done that allowed to build a unified relational database that gave us the possibility to first define an event window in event analysis, which may be useful in order to see the methodology. The idea is to first establish an event win window that comprises both in the middle the event day and then 
an estimation window which comes beforehand where one makes uh, point estimates of the returns that one should expect for stock, uh, from stock market prices, and then one would linearly project out of the sample after the event has occurred in order to see whether there is a difference between uh, the expected return and the return that has actually occurred, and this gives rise to the notion of an abnormal return. The idea is that in Italy we took as the event day the march on Rome and after we built the estimation window, we obtained the point estimates and we could then compute the cumulative abnormal returns. But this is one part of the story. Methodologically, the other part concerns identifying which are the firms that are politically connected. And one of the points of the paper was precisely to proceed endogenously corroborating with a statistical learning algorithm, which is you have an interlocking directorates technique that will tell you if in the board of directors of a firm you have two people that sit in the boards of different firms, then the number of people shared by two firms will establish a link. This algorithm would try to do is with this distant matrix then try to partition the structure of links in the Italian economy in 1921, those who were in the Milan stock exchange, there were other stock exchanges, but we only focus on the Milan one, which was the most important at the time. And we build these clusters. The idea is that these clusters are endogenous, so we would endogenously get a, a set, a partition of the set of firms. Now this has to be corroborated by historiographic evidence, so this is what made it really important to go through the individuals that comprise the links in that network and then try to bridge the clustering <coughs> results with historiographic evidence. When this has been done, then we finally obtained the cluster of connected firms. And this, as Titian had just pointed out, gave rise to interesting historic events connected to, for example, the bailout of the Bank of Rome and different sectoral details as to the connection of this cluster that contains those firms that were particularly uh, connected through the results that we then obtain in the event analysis. And that's when cumulative abnormal returns, that is the difference between what we would expect from the pre-event window, the estimation window, was to be verified when abnormal returns became higher for the cluster of connected firms. And basically, once you get that, you want to run a cross-sectional, for example, analysis to study whether these log returns that obtain, were obtained before and after <coughs> the March on Rome uh, were particularly correlated to specific characteristics. And amongst the, the number of scenarios and regressions that we run, when we estimated these linear probability models, one of the key elements was precisely being connected. And what these results show basically is that connectedness to uh, the National Fascist Party in the coefficient associated to CL1 in this slide. What shows is that before the event window, you cannot see a statistically significant effect on the returns that these firms would obtain, but after the event, win after the, the event and during and after the event, you could precisely see that differential uh, in terms of the returns that would be obtained. And this is precisely the key of the, the event analysis that has been carried out. That is, to merge network analysis to endogenally determine connected firms corroborated by historiographic evidence and then using the cluster, uh, the event analysis in order to quantify this. And as Tiziana has concluded, this gave rise to a 2.8 uh, percent excess returns on a compounded monthly basis, which amounts to almost 40 percent of a yearly uh, difference in the returns by those firms that were connected to the fascist regime at the beginning, during the March of Rome and after. Yes, of course. Uh, It'll come on automatically. Yeah. Um, just about the um, thing of, I mean, about network analysis, uh, with respect to what you did for the German case, the problem is, I think that in the Italian case, this connects somehow to the question you, you asked before, 
a fascist regime could uh, take power so fast because I think there was a, I mean, uh, the elite was scared by the rise of the Communist Party. So somehow, um, in one way or another, almost all firms were somehow connected to uh, to the rise of the fascist regime. So our necessity was that of finding those firms that were direct, I mean, actively connected, and that couldn't be done simply by historiographic uh, analysis itself ex ante, because it would have been impossible to identify, I think, just a small group of firms. And so we tried to, um, to perform this network analysis in order to first separate different groups, then to see whether there were some group which outperformed the others before going to historiographic uh, analysis. And then actually, historiographic analysis could confirm that this group of firms were actually actively uh, supporting Mussolini before the March on Rome. So of course, this is a peculiarity of the Italian case. Uh, it was maybe not necessary to do so for the German case, but uh, it was kind of, um, necessity given the, this peculiarity to find out a way to identify a group uh, in an endogenous way rather than arbitrarily choose a group of firms. Okay, thank you. Now, Peter, do you want to present your actual comment? Yeah. Well, it's hard for me to comment because I'm not a statistician. You don't have to comment on Italy at all. You can go right back to Germany. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in Germany, the situation turned out to be different. The Nazis, for some time, uh, for the decade of the 20s, uh, were not really influential. They were a small splinter party, and they were much ridiculed in public up to 1930. Uh, but even before the Nazis became strong, there were endeavors by influential pressure groups uh, and by certain influential individuals to do away with the Weimar Republic and with the uh, democ democracy, first democracy on German soil. Now, even today, some people hold the view that the Weimar Republic was doomed right from the start, that uh, the collapse of that republic was certain, and that nobody could prevent this, not even uh, the most important or the most powerful businessmen. I'm arguing for the antithesis to this view, uh, I say the Weimar Republic collapsed at the end of the 1920s or the beginning of the 1930s because influential individuals <coughs> who can clearly be identified and the pressure groups behind them tried or worked hard to dismantle this democratic republic. So it didn't, so to speak, implode by itself, uh, but it was destroyed by powerful groups in society who wanted to have a government or a constitution uh, according to an authoritarian model. They didn't want to have uh, democracy. And they were almost successful in certain steps along the way in the 20s. I want to mention four uh, situations, uh, four crises of the Weimar Republic, uh, where it was almost a miracle that this democratic state survived, that it didn't collapse much earlier, not only uh, in the 30s. First, there were the problems right at the start, uh, after the revolution of 1918, uh, in the time between 1918 and 1920. Uh, there was almost a civil war on German streets, and 
powerful businessmen, <coughs> among them Paul Reusch, who I wrote the biography about, uh, they asked the government, the government was led by social democrats at that time, to use military power to suppress that unrest in the streets and to uh, end the strikes. And unfortunately, the uh, government led by social democrats at that time did what uh, the business community expected them to do. I think one can say it was the business community because I found quite a number of uh, documents uh, that telegrams were sent to Berlin urging <coughs> the government uh, to use military power against the strikers. So the Reichswehr came in and uh, they were supported by so-called Freikorps troops and uh, there was a wave of violence against striking and demonstrating workers in the time between uh, the beginning of 1919 to spring of 1920, at least 2,000 workers were killed, many of them not in the fighting, but they were executed by those troops. And this, of course, caused a lot of resentments among the working class. They, had, they saw their comrades in government and their comrades in government had sent uh, the army against uh, demonstrating workers. It's almost a miracle that uh, the Weimar democracy survived this first crisis in its history. Second stage, uh, the hyperinflation in 1923. Uh, things had been going quite well for some time, uh, but then uh, the inflation became from a slow inflation, which business profited from into a galloping uh, inflation and finally the hyperinflation when in the government had to print uh, money by the tons every day. Uh, this was the time when French troops had occupied the Ruhr And one of the reasons for this inflation was that uh, the passive resistance of the workers against that occupation. Uh, so uh, the workers were needed to fight against French occupation, but at the same time, the business leaders uh, worked hard to dismantle all the uh, rules, uh, all the achievements they had reached in, in the social sphere. Most, of po most important, the eight hours work day, which was abolished at that time. So after that crisis, there was uh, a lot of resentment against the French, to be sure but also against the power elites who had used the workers to resist French occupation, but who were not willing to stay to some of the social uh, achievements of the Republic. <coughs> Again, it was uh, almost a miracle that uh, the Weimar democracy survived. Third stage, 1928, the lockout in the steel industry. After the inflation crisis of 1923, people witnessed a surprisingly fast re recovery. 
the employers used favorable conditions, the favorable conditions in, uh, in the economy to rationalize their companies. Especially in the coal mines, the workforce was reduced at a quick pace, but it was not only in the coal mines, it was in other parts of the economy uh, too that unemployment grew even before the depression uh, in the beginning of the 1930s. These unemployed young men at that time, they became the recruiting ground for Hitler's Nazis at the, after 1930. In these circumstances, which were quite favorable for the employers, they were no longer willing to compromise. Uh, collective bargaining introduced in 1918 in the famous Stinnes Legin Pact broke down. The employers refused to submit to compulsory arbitration by the government. And in the wage conflict of 1928, in the steel industry of the Ruhr, the bosses locked out over 200,000 steel workers for several weeks. Once again, uh, the workers, of course, were furious. Uh, resentment grew against uh, the bosses. Uh, but when they finally, uh, the employers agreed to a new, uh, or found an agreement uh, about wages and working hours, uh, a lot of resentment rested with the workers. They were alienated from that uh, democratic republic. Uh, the fourth step was the breach of the Grand Coalition. And uh, in the election of 1928, democratic parties for the last time in uh, the Weimar Republic won a majority in the Reichstag. They formed a grand coalition from the so Social Democrats on the left uh, to the People's Party on the right. This coalition broke up in spring 1930 in a conflict about uh, unemployment benefits for the workers. The employers and the People's Party, who was dependent on the money from uh, big business, uh, refused to compromise with respect to unemployment benefits. They refused to raise contributions, of which they had to pay 50%, uh, or use tax money for unemployment benefits. So when this coalition government broke down, uh, from that on, the, uh, the Weimar Republic was not a real democracy anymore uh, with the new chancellor, Heinrich Brüning, there uh, started the time when this republic was governed by decrees. So it was not in the... Uh, original sense of the word, a dem parliamentary democracy anymore. After that, uh, the Nazis won one landslide election victory after another. And after that uh, comes in what Tom had said, uh, big business worked for uh, Hitler's seizure of power. So Hitler didn't seize the power, but it was handed to him by influential power groups in uh, 1933. But the story had begun already three years earlier. Uh, the Weimar Republic collapsed. So that's uh, what I found uh, in the sources and in, uh, in the files, it collapsed uh, because powerful pressure groups worked hard 
to dismantle it. I have to stop you because I've taken up. That's okay. We have, we're not short of time, and I didn't take anything like a full time. Mm. But if you need a minute to finish, you could have it. It might just summarize. No, I, okay. Mm. All right. Th thank you very much, Peter. Um, it's maybe worth noticing that uh, if you go into the archives in Germany, you often find a very different set of uh, things than are, make most of the histories. If you go into the same Cologne archive that has most of Reusch's papers, you will also see some stuff on Vereinigte Stahl, which was the largest of all the steel companies. Uh, and there you'll discover that uh, pretty strong hints in the section on Albert Fergler, who was the head of the concern, he was working hard to try to overthrow the regime in a kind of near miss, which is kind of shadowy in 1926, along with all the others. He was around for uh, the takeover too. There are lots of more that could be added here, but we have Jim Kurth to now make a comment on these papers, and there is nobody I would rather listen to on either of these subjects, Italy or Germany. So, Jim, it's yours. Well, I'd love to talk about Germany, including Weimar Germany, and love to talk about Italy, including Trasfamismo, that is to say, the immediately preceding pre-fascist period of Italy. But we have experts here, and I would quickly disgrace myself, since they would quickly correct me. What I am going to do, however, is take uh, the, um, uh, the, the subtitle of our panel today, Lessons from Past Democratic Collapses, and then bring those lessons from the past democratic uh, collapses fast forward to our present democratic discontents. And I do think there are lessons to be drawn from the collapse of the Weimar, of, of Weimar Republic and Trasfermismo Italy. I think there are lessons to be drawn, and they are variations on the themes of our paper givers and Peter Lang's uh, commentary a moment ago. But uh, it's not going to issue in a democratic collapse. The primary lesson that I'm going to draw, and you can disagree or, or, uh, or agree, is that it won't be a democratic collapse. It will be something else. But let me uh, first begin with a kind of comparison and contrast between the conditions in Weimar Germany and Trasfermismo Italy and the current uh, uh, Western powers. Uh, we could say Germany today or Italy today, but I feel that the contrast that I'm looking for is most greatly pronounced in the Anglo-Saxon powers, that is to say the United Kingdom and the United States. Now returning briefly to an overview of the bigger picture, uh, of uh, Weimar Germany and Trasfermismo Italy. First, I'd like to look at the political structure. Uh, and we notice there that there is a classical parliamentary system, uh, multi-party, so multi-party, there are very many parties. That's the macrocosm of the system. And the microcosm is the structure of the parties themselves. They're large, organized parties. Uh, so organized, so hierarchical, that they even have, at the time of the collapse of the respective republics, they even have a large large, organized, paramilitary organizations. The origins of those lay in the immediate aftermath of World War I, as Peter Langer has mentioned. That is to say, there were lots of unemployed veterans who knew how to use arms. There were lots of striking workers, and there were quite a few businessmen who wanted to use the unemployed uh, veterans against the striking workers. And you got the, uh, you got the beginning of paramilitary groups supported by businesses to smash organized labor. That was even in the uh, immediate aftermath of World War I. Of course, that would ultimately crest in the fascist so-called March on Rome, uh, but uh, in Italy, but then 10 years later, of course, with the so-called seizure of power uh, by uh, the Nazi party in uh, Weimar, Germany. And Peter Langer, I think, is putting those particular uh, concepts in their proper place. Now, uh, as we notice this, uh, we uh, see that, uh, th that big business is organized to smash big labor, which is organized. Now, that is the pattern of those two countries in that, that time. Moving quickly to the economy, we see that the economy in those days and in those countries, it was the large industrial economy, less industrial in, in Italy, of course, but up there in Turin and Milan, there was very significant, heavy, organized industry, which meant large, organized labor unions once again. 
So these are industrial economies along with their large organized labor unions and their large organized business out to smash them. Then we have also that these are national economies. They're protectionist. Uh, and they're so protectionist that when foreign trade, uh, which isn't that important, is cut off, then they can naturally tend towards becoming arm armament uh, industries. A national protection of industry can become a national protection with arms. Uh, and so you have a, a, a pattern of large industrial economies, uh, large national economies in the high modern age. The way I'm phrasing it, you can already see that there are significant differences between then and now, between those high industrial, high national, high modern economies or societies and the post-industrial, the global and the uh, uh, post-modern information age uh, uh, societies we have today. Now the consequences back then of this particular pattern, uh, large organized business, large organized labor, was there was a large but disorganized middle class. These were the people who were left behind at the time. These are especially the small towns, the small retailers, the small farmers, uh, the small businessmen. Uh, Emil Weiser, Weiser, who you introduced us to a few minutes ago, is a perfect archetype of this particular kind of left behind small middle class uh, person. Um, and uh, it was so much a, a conception at the time there was even a popular novel called uh, um, Little Man, What Now? Uh, and so this was a very big pattern. The middle class of the day, both the upper middle class professionals and the lower middle class small businessmen found themselves being ground down between hammer and anvil of organized business and organized uh, labor. Um, and therefore, uh, when the center parties of the day often sold themselves out to the big business of the time, then this pati these particular voters were open to more national or populist appeals. And indeed, small n, small s, national national socialist appeals. Uh, and so we can begin to see uh, that uh, this, this is bringing about a particular dynamic in those two countries. All of this made it very, uh, very um, worthwhile for big business to do exactly what our papers said it did, to buy influence, to buy access uh, with big nationalist parties, and especially those that would have a pseudo-socialist or a pseudo-populist uh, thing uh, to them. And along the, along the way, they would not only get votes, but they would get these parties and their paramilitary organizations organizations to smash organized labor. And this was the pattern in 1922-23 in Italy and in 1932-33 in Germany. Uh, this could bring about, therefore, the appearance of a march on Rome, a seizure of power, uh, uh, an act, but what it seemed to issue in an actual dramatic collapse of the democratic regime. Although Peter Langer points out there was a slow erosion or corrosion of the Weimar regime in the years before. And I'm going to suggest that's the pattern we're likely to see in our own time and in our own democracies. But now quickly moving forward to the uh, current particular period, and I'll skip over Germany and Italy, where there would be fascinating comparisons between those countries then and now. But I will focus on the United Kingdom and the United States, especially on the United States. Now notice as soon as we begin to look at the political th situation, well, of course, we have a parliamentary system system in Britain, and we have a presidential system in America. But really, the idea of having many parties, that's not quite Anglo-Saxon. And it's also the case that those parties that exist really are not highly organized and hierarchical. They certainly don't have paramilitary groups uh, operating with them. Uh, and so already there, we see a party is not as so much in a powerful thing that big business might want to attract in the old-fashioned way. Economically, of course, we've already seen that we've moved from an industrial era uh, to uh, a post-industrial, but more particularly financial and uh, information technology era, and from national economies to an EU economy, but even more a global economy. Now, what does this mean for the middle class? If they're no longer quite ground down between the old style hammer and anvil, the anvil, the working class, is hardly an anvil. It's just a 
big mush at this particular point in many countries, especially in the United States. What does it mean for the middle class? Well, now the middle class, unlike the middle class in Italy and Germany at that time, is now split split between the upper middle class professionals who of course are very much information age, very much global, very urban, very urbane, and the lower middle class. Again, the small towns, the small cities, the small businessmen, the small farmers, uh, the same kind of people we met in Weimar, Germany. Now they exist, of course, in Britain and in America. Uh, these are the people who are uh, in the uh, precariat that we heard about yesterday. And these are the people who engage in being atavistic or nostalgic, uh, as um, Guy uh, Standing mentioned us. But it's not the entire middle class. Uh, and in addition, there are the children of the professional upper middle class who find themselves in a position being ground down to a lower middle class or lower. These are the third group that uh, Guy uh, Standing mentioned yesterday. Those who have aspirations but see them being blighted. It's all been a lie. Uh, so they're not so much the atavistic or the nostalgic, they're the activistic. Uh, uh, like, they're like uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street or like the Sanders voters today. Now, uh, the center parties today have certainly ceded leadership to big capital, but this is a very different big capital than it was in the earlier time. This is financial capital, information age capital, global capital. It can make an alliance with the middle class, uh, that is say the upper middle class, just like this big business made an alliance with the entire middle class in the earlier time, uh, because that upper middle class is also, it's now global and elitist rather than national and populist. So uh, this means um, that um, the lower middle class, the industrial working class that used to be valuable to the big capital sector is no longer valuable if it's found in the UK or the US. What's valuable to them is an alliance, uh, is an alliance with the lower middle class and the industrial working class, the ones they can make profit from in the peripheral countries, in Eastern Europe, in Latin America, and in uh, East Asia. So this means it is not worthwhile for big business to buy influence or access with nationalist or populist parties like they did in the earlier time. Uh, moreover, the nationalists and the populists are not even organized, certainly in the UK or the US, into parties, hardly even into movements. Where there was a Brexit movement, I suppose, or a Sanders movement, or merely they just have a following, a following, like Trump had a following. Uh, rather, no one has really found it in their interest to fund big organized parties that are nationalist or populist. So uh, this means big capital does not want to buy by the, uh, the population that has been left behind, that is tending towards nationalist or populist attitudes. They don't want to buy them, they want to bury them. <sighs> And so, no, so, let me, so let me just very quickly conclude. Uh, and so the left behind are expendable economically. So they can be marginalized. Therefore, the establishment is uh, developing an ideology that these people are deplorable. They should be marginalized. Ah, oh, but in the 2016 elections, uh, these people still had the residual asset of being able to vote. And therefore, of course, it's important that the establishment begin to minimize and marginalize the role of the vote. In other words, not to end so much with the collapse of a dem democracy, but with the corrosion of a democracy. Not fast motion, but slow motion. And so let me just conclude by mentioning six methods by which the establishment is corroding uh, the democracies of our time. First is the method they've used for quite some time in the United States and tried to deploy big time in the 2016 elections, high barriers to entry for candidates uh, that say have to have lots of money, uh, you have to pass through all sorts of complicated primary uh, rules and regulations. Uh, that didn't work so well 
uh, in the Republican Party, it barely worked in the Democratic Party, but the elites are still doubling down on those old methods, hoping the next time around, if they double down more, then they will work the next time. But the elites aren't going to be satisfied with just that. So they're turning now to try to get the left behinds to not identify in themselves in interest politics, but in identity politics, to set uh, the various groups of the left behinds against each other, rather than against the elites. That was mentioned by Shannon uh, 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 Monet uh, uh, earlier today. Then uh, they are allow social pathologies to develop. It isn't that they promote them, well, some people have said that, but they do allow them. And the social pathologies not only set the, uh, the people against, the, uh, the uh, lower people against um, uh, each other as groups, but they sort of make them into isolated individuals who essentially uh, uh, grands of sand as opposed to organized groups. Um, then uh, they are, of course, of also um, uh, uh, beginning now to uh, uh, um, have a massive media campaign uh, in the elite media against these people as being, as I say, uh, de expendable, deplorable, or as I remarked earlier uh, today, even despicable. In other words, to marginalize them in the minds of the people at the top and in their elites, the urban and the urbane. Uh, then, of course, we now saw recently they're going to restrict access to social media because it wasn't just the old vote, but the new social media that empowered the left behind in the last elections. Uh, and so they're beginning to restrict access to that. Uh, this or that extreme website, to the left or to the right, are being marginalized or eliminated from the social media. And finally, I finally, I think we will see increased surveillance in these particular uh, uh, societies, a nice union of the high information age technology and a long established government that has always worked closely uh, with the, uh, the big business elite. And so in the end, I think it can be said that as we move from the national to the, po to the post-national to the global, from the industrial to the post-industrial to the financial and the information age, uh, when we move to that, the democracy will not die from uh, annihilation. Uh, no, no, it will die from asphyxiation. No, it will not die with a bang. It will die with a whimper. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, we have about eight minutes left, and my inclination seems like nobody needs to reply to critics here on the panel, uh, since everybody seems in relative harmony. Why don't we take questions from the audience? Um, okay, right, all right, back there first, and the, and then we'll come down to the there. I'm good. Yeah. So thanks to the speakers for a very interesting panel and some very interesting research. So the, the really big thing that hit me, and it's something that Jim was talking about in his discussion, is, is the big difference between what we're seeing now versus what we saw uh, in the 1930s is that in the 1930s, populism was able to find some kind of connection with big business, right? And that consolidated in itself into what we would have called in the old kind of political sociology end of political economy, corporatism, right? And it led to what we would see of, see as the fascist economic model of a, a state-led economic growth, right? And if that's the case, right, so if the magic connection is the connection between populism and big business, right, is that the thing that's missing at the moment, right? Because kind of as kind of Jim pointed out, it's very hard to envision... Um, kind of corporate interests linking up with a lot of these populist movements internationally. So is that the lesson, one of the lessons we can learn here? That was uh, that's the lesson that, uh, one of the lessons that I uh, uh, believe can be learned. Does anybody want to come in? Your um, camera. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be so optimistic. Uh, the number of American Republicans, <coughs> businesses that flip-flopped to the winning side after November last year I thought was mind-blowing. 
Um, so it may not be in their interest, as <coughs> it was not in the interest of German big business to back a regime that completely ruined the country in 12 years flat. Um, but that doesn't mean they won't do it. Um, and uh, I know less about the British case, but my first instinctive reaction would be never underestimate human stupidity. Uh, maybe one quick comment. I, I, since my colleagues, uh, Paul Jorgensen and Ji Chen, I have quite exact information on where big business was sitting in the 2016 election. That's for later in the program. Um, it's worth noticing that the <coughs> use of populism, as far as I can tell in every panel in this program <coughs> thus far, has tended to concentrate only on what might be called right populism. We've had there's essentially no Sanders <coughs> in Europe that I can see uh, at all, except for Mélenchon maybe in, what's that? Well, no, he, I would not consider him a left populist. We, maybe we just disagree. There I'm just gonna stipulate no. Um, <laughs> he, he looks to me like a right populist of a very conventional stripe. Uh, there. In any case, uh, the point is uh, left populist <coughs> movements do happen, and they've happened in you know, the New Deal is for sure a movement that finally came along with the support of a chunk, capital-intensive, internationally-oriented big business. But there were also a, an enormous upsurge of unionism and movements that seemed utterly dead in the late 1920s. <coughs> um, that happened uh, in France where it was broken, as it were, by a movement against it um, and, an interna and an international flight problem on the franc. Um, but this stuff happens too. And in that sense, uh, let's not persuade ourselves that the only way that people actually make headway is to sort of, in effect, sell your leadership out to big business. That, that's a little bit more, uh, there's actually more historical possibilities here than one might say. Now, there were quite, I don't, what, who has questions? Yes, that gentleman there. Yeah. Jim Clapham, Warsaw University. Uh, my impression is the, pa the panel or the later comments were basically saying uh, that the big business has gradually withdrawn from the business of buying the political process. Um, but isn't in fact that not quite true? Um, if you take our own Conservative Party here and have a look at who donates to them, you then begin to realise uh, the direction they are moving. And you can see this very clearly in terms of uh, taxation, uh, in terms of approaches to uh, other forms of legislation. I in the States, you can see uh, that they haven't exactly necessarily bought a populist party, but in fact they are buying economic policy. Um, we can see in the European Union that in many ways the lobbyists, which in fact invest vast sums of money, are also affecting the political process. We've discussed that this morning uh, with the ph uh, pharmaceutical industry. So though it is not leading, uh, shall we say, to the, uh, they're not supporting the direct uh, collapse of a democracy, their support for, shall we say, non-democratic forces has in fact uh, been quite significant and in some ways as great as, if not more than, what happened in the 20s. Want to come with it? Actually, I would agree with that last conclusion, the distinction between a collapse uh, and some other way of dismantling the democracy. Um, that. Um, uh, th uh, they uh, are uh, 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 not only back in the Weimar Germany and in Italy, they were obviously bringing about the collapse. Uh, here, I think they're bringing about, as I said, the corrosion. But in any event, at the end of the day, the democracy will be dead. Uh, now, uh, the, the way to bring about it uh, then, in that high industrial, high modern uh, situation, was with a mass party. Here, now the way to do it is kind of with le elite uh, organizations, associations, uh, that sort of thing. And so they don't, it's not so much that they bring about an end to the democracy through the populist route, they bring about it uh, into it through now, for example, often in here in Europe, the technocratic route. Yeah. 
We have time for one last question, and I see a very distinguished German economic historian out there, I think, with his hand up. So, Carl, why don't you, uh, I think we'd be all glad to hear this question, and we may have time for an answer. I have uh, two comments on Peter Langer's uh, remarks. Uh, one is that hyperinflation did not start with the occupation of the Ruhr, but it started half a year earlier in July 1922. And this was because um, the Reparation Commission had uh, asked a committee of bankers, the so-called Morgan Committee, to examine the possibilities for capital imports into Germany to stabilize uh, reparation payments uh, on the one hand and the currency on the other hand. Uh, and uh, the uh, Morgan Committee refused, uh, saying that first the reparation demands must be reduced. Uh, that's uh, one comment. And the other one is an answer to your question. You uh, uh, posed the question, why um, did um, the fascist movement take over so much later in Germany than in Italy? I would say um, the reason is that Italy was fully hit by the Great Depression of 1920-22. Germany wasn't. It had full employment. Uh, almost up until, well, until the Ruhr occupation. And I think this is the similarity. The Great Depression, the early one, hit Italy, which didn't hit Germany, but um, the Great Depression afterwards was the cause for Hitler's so seizure of power. Tiziana, if you have a 20 second remark, you Just can make it. Um, as for the case of Italy, um, there were strikes in the factories and the perception of uh, a communist danger. I think that's the main difference between the two cases. And um, for this reason, I think that Mussolini had, uh, was supported by the big magnates of uh, electrical sectors and uh, uh, sugar sector and so on from 1914 onwards. This is. Okay, look, we're out of time. Thank you all very much for coming. And thanks to the panelists for their presentation.